In this video, I put together board game designers or publishers tips, some may already featured in our how to play videos. And stay tuned till the end, hopefully you'll find some tips that are useful for you to play your next favorite games. Coming up! Hi everyone, hope you well. It's Stella from Evil University. Welcome back to my weekly tabletop diary. I don't have Taryn with me this time. So sometimes when I play a game for the first time, I feel like it might be handy to have some beginner's tip in hand to at least guide you for the first game. Or if you have played the game, you may want to try a different strategy. So for this vlog, I thought it would be handy to compile these tips together Put them in a few series of videos so you can watch them before playing your favorite games. I've also added timestamp below by the way, so if you want to go to a particular game or designers, you can just go there. Um, now, because I have a few of these tips, I'm splitting this into a few of my episodes. Um, and if there is a particular game that you want us to get tips from designers or publishers, please write in the comment sections below. I can't promise anything but I can try my best to put them together for you and I'll release this in my vlog every now and then. So here it is, Board Game Strategy Series, episode number one with Jamie Stegmaier for Tapestry, Alan Embrick for Nemo's War and James Wilson for Everdell. And first, starting with a bang, first one in the series, some basic and advanced tips from Jamie Stegmaier for Tapestry. Hey, this is Jamie from Stonemeyer Games. Stella from Meeple University asked me to talk about some strategy tips for our new game, uh, Tapestry. Tapestry. Uh, so I thought I would jump on and give you five quick strategy tips for, for Tapestry. These are tips for beginners or, or expert players. I think it applies to both. So tip number one is that uh, income in the game is really, really important. And with income specifically, I would recommend that you diversify early and then focus later in the game. So if you look at these income tracks, uh, the first space on each track is gonna be revealed at the beginning of the game. So you see you get a resource there in your first income turn. Um, but there are buildings coming, covered up the other, covering up the other spots. These second two slots right here also have uh, resource income on them, but the third slots don't. So that's the same on all of the tracks here. So I recommend as early as possible in the game, get those first four income buildings off these tracks diversify, and then choose one of these tracks to focus on. These are income tracks that correspond with the tracks on the board. Focus on them because once you get past that third spot, there are two more resources here that you can gain if you gain those income buildings. So tip number one is to uh, focus on income by diversifying early and focusing late. And that ties into my second tip, number two, which is to choose one track on the board and go after it as early as possible. Go after completing that track as early as possible. There are four tracks on this board. You can kind of see the beginning of uh, technology here and the end of military. Choose one of these tracks, maybe based on your early tapestry card, based on your civilization, choose one of them and really go all out in completing it because at the end of the track are really powerful benefits. And sometimes those benefits are uh, particularly powerful if you gain them before the end of the game, like if you have a full round to play with those benefits after gaining them. So pick one of these advancement tracks, focus on it, and try to accomplish it and complete it as early as, as you can in the game. That's tip number two. Um, tip number three is a little one, and it's just plan ahead for your tapestry cards. Every income turn, including the first income turn, you're going to get one of these tapestry cards, and you can gain more on the advancement tracks and through other various benefits throughout the game. But look at them frequently throughout the game. When it's not your turn, look at these tapestry cards and think, okay, what am I going to do? Which is the next tapestry card I'm going to play? And based on that, what are the things that I'm not going to do now and that I'm planning to do, that I'm setting up to do right after I play this tapestry card? Some of them are when played abilities, so you just need to plan ahead for when you actually play it. Others are this era ability, so you need to be ready for uh, an era where you focus maybe on a specific thing guided by this tapestry card. So that's tip number three. Look at your tapestry cards in hand and plan ahead for them, uh, both in terms of what you're doing now or what you're not doing now and what you plan on doing after you play the tapestry card. Tip number four is 
Of course, to pay attention to your civilization. Tapestry comes with 16 different civilizations. All of them are very powerful in their own right, especially if you find little combinations with these and the various tracks in the game, the tapestry cards, the tech cards. So really look at your civilization and let it guide you. Um, a lot of them offer free things, so you don't have to really plan ahead for them and do them, um, or plan ahead for, for the resources to be able to do them. But these, these civilizations are very powerful, and so let them guide you, especially in your first few games of Tapestry when you're trying to figure out exactly what you want to do. And even later games, when you've tried different strategies, let the civilizations guide your strategy to a certain extent. They don't dictate your strategy, but they can guide it a little bit. That's tip number four. Tip number five, my last... Uh, tip is probably the most obvious one, which is that every resource in this game really matters. This ties a little bit back to my original number one about income. Every resource matters. Every turn matters. If you can stretch out each round, each era for yourself a little bit more, so you take one more resource. If you somehow get a resource from exploring or a technology card or, or on one of the advancement tracks, and you're able to get one more resource and then spend that other resource on something else. Um, if you're able to fill in one of the uh, districts in your capital city. So if you fill in the, the Seattle Capital City is divided into these nine different three by three uh, grids. If you're able to fill one of those in, this little key here reminds you that you get an, an instant resource right away of your choice right away. So that can be something that, that you can do to get one more resource. Um, the one consideration here, it ties again back to income, is uh, the thing to keep in mind with these one more resource strategies is uh, if you're not actually, if you're getting kind of near the end of your uh, advancement turns and you need to take an income turn because you're running low on the resources, uh, taking one more turn may not always be best if you're not actually increasing your income or no longer using your tapestry card for that round. So uh, you, might, you might decide to pass early if you are not increasing your income because you're really focusing on getting that income up right before you take that income turn. Uh, so that can be something to keep in mind because there are benefits in the game if you are the first to pass of your neighbors into the next uh, income turn, into the next era. Uh, there, there are some resource benefits there too. So think about if you are able to actually increase your income before passing, and if not, uh, you might consider going ahead and passing a little bit early to gain those bonus resources. Those are my five tips for uh, new and even advanced tapestry players. I'd love to hear your tips in the comments below things that you've discovered as you've played Tapestry. Thanks. Ahoy, Captains. Alan Emmerich here from Victory Point Games, and I am the second edition designer and developer for Nemo's War. Now, God bless first edition designer Chris Taylor, who did an outstanding job and trusted me to deliver this second edition that we're so passionate about and that you've just learned about on Meeple University. But right now, I want to take you with me on a Nautilus voyage to see the world as a winning player would see it as they play Nemo's War. Hi, welcome to my game table. Alan Emmerich here. And I wanted to show you the critical step that winning players use in Nemo's War to get those high scores. And we all know that step one is to draw an adventure card and, uh, and do the adventure. It is step two, where you roll the dice to play ships that a winning player makes far-sighted, advantageous moves. Okay, you ready? So this is just, uh, you, we're here in mid-game. Oop, there's the Nautilus so you can see it. We're here in mid-game and I roll the dice and it comes back this way, actually, it's act three, you can tell because, hey, look, black dice is added. Um, and we take the numbers in order, three, five, five, six, and we place ships on the board. Well, I mean, because you're a player, the first thing you do is you look at the greatest differential in the white dice and you see it's uh, six minus three is three, so you give yourself three actions and you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, all right, we're gonna have a good turn, we got three actions. But now you have to place ships, and you have to place a ship in each of these major oceans. All of the major oceans, you can see, are numbered. So we have to place a ship token in ocean number three. Well, to do that, we use the ship placement priority protocols. So ocean number three is full. We can place a ship in a neighboring ocean. Uh, let us place a ship here then a, a hidden ship token in a neighboring ocean. 
So three, five. Now five has a space, so we can drop a ship right there. But guess what? There's a second five. That means no place here, no place open in a neighboring ocean. These are connected by the Suez Canal. Not that you can move through it, but for ship placement purposes, they're connected. So this guy's got nowhere to go. So if you look at the next protocol on the ship placement priority queue, it says you get to draw a ship token. And you're gonna place a face up ship token. And now this is the important part. You can place it either in the number you rolled, ocean number five, or an adjacent ocean that has a hidden ship token. You're going to exchange a hidden ship token for a revealed one. So you have to think, what is my motive? Where do I want to place this? And the particularly bad news here is that it is a warship. And where you place a warship, hmm, where do I place this warship? I'll probably place it up here, actually, in, in the ocean I rolled. Because placing a second warship in an ocean is a real problem. That means to sink one, the other one is escorting it and is going to put a whammy, a minus one die roll on all your efforts to, uh, to, to hit it and bring it down because it's got an escort. So putting that second warship in any ocean is bad. This is called painting the board where you fill it up with uh, ship tokens and are trying to range the revealed ones the way you want them. And then finally, Ocean 6. Well, there's no space here in Ocean 6, no space next door. But as you can see, this ocean connects to this ocean. And because the world is... Did you say round? Don't say round. The world is cylindrical. You're playing Nemo's War. The map is flooded. But it does connect on the side. So uh, we will add a hidden ship token here to the adjacent ocean. Now, if I placed... Let's just fast forward, say this is what the board looks like. And I play ships again for next turn. Uh, I would have to, whoops, another five, three, one, three, five, six. Oh, wow. Well, at least I have five actions. That's good. Uh, placing a ship in ocean one means this is the only space that's available that's connected to ocean one that's free. Uh, ocean three is going to be a problem. It's all filled up. So I would have to draw another ship and paint the board. Now, oh, good. A second uh non-warship okay well we'll put that right over here because uh, we can just float by there someday and collect it uh depending on my motive now i gotta think what is my motive uh ocean five that's full again so we have to draw you see this is the dangerous time in the game because the ship the ship the board is filling up with ships and uh well since this is so warship heavy i might as well add another one and i'm just going to stay the heck out of the european seas it's way too dangerous for me so that's like my happy dumping ground and then uh, a six this is all full the neighbors here is full the neighbor there is full that means we get to draw a revealed ship token whoops and where do i want a warship oh boy i don't want it here to add a second warship i don't want it here to add a second warship i will put it here and kind of set that aside off to itself so the secret is where you place your warships, your non-warships that are revealed as the board fills up and the protocols tell you to do that. One word of advice, do not let the board fill up with ships because if you need to place a warship and there is no space, everything is warship occupied, you will lose the game. That's an imperialist victory. That means they've hunted down the Nautilus and you're trapped. So, painting the board, how you put revealed ships on the map is the secret sauce toward optimizing your score. Alan Emmerich here, Victory Point Games, wishing you a bon voyage. Hi, I'm James Wilson. I am the designer of Everdell, here to share some tips and strategy with you. Everdell is a worker placement game that is also combined with a card comboing tableau building game. You will be competing uh, to build the best little woodland city over the course of a year in the Valley of Everdell. Uh, like a lot of worker placement games and card comboing engine games, you want to figure out some way to have a system or, or an engine going for you pretty early in the game that's going to work for you as the game progresses. 
Um, obviously, you can get resources by placing your workers out into certain areas and gathering twigs or resin or whatever you need there. But if you build the right cards in your city, they're going to essentially do that job for you. So that would be uh, tip number one is to try and get an engine going pretty early within the game. There's a couple different ways to do this. The most common way is by using the green production cards, which will continue to produce for you during production. And those are great. Um, another way, though, that, that some players don't grasp quite as quickly is the blue cards. The blue cards are governance cards, and they will work for you as you work. So as you do something, they are going to do something for you in return. And these can be very powerful and very useful. And some sort of combination uh, of both of these cards pretty early on can really help you as the game progresses. So get an engine going, uh, some form of it as quickly as you can is usually a good idea. Also, don't be afraid to discard cards from your hand. Now, you have a strict hand limit of only eight cards, and it can be hard to want to get rid of some of them because you feel like you need to build them or you want to build them. But in some cases, it may be better to go ahead and do that. Uh, there are locations like Haven or some of the other force locations where you can discard cards to uh, get resources back. Or sometimes uh, you can go to the post office and discard cards to draw a whole bunch of new cards. And this can really help you when you find some new options to have some combos and some systems that will, will work. So don't be afraid to get rid of some cards out of your hand to see some new cards and some new things that come up that could be helpful for you. Uh, the special events are something you should pay attention to in each of the games, and they're going to be different every single time. These can sometimes be hard to achieve because they require specific cards to achieve them. However, they can also be very powerful as far as points, and some of them even give you a special bonus when you achieve them. You should definitely pay attention to them and try to achieve them if you can. But if you can't, then you should also be okay passing on them and letting going after a different strategy because you can get too locked into them sometimes and and feel like you just have to achieve them because you have one card toward them and you'll miss another potential strategy that you could pursue and that you could do you should really also pay attention to the purple prosperity cards in the game these can score some big points for you in the end and that's typically the time when you're going to really be wanting to hunt for them and, and play them. Sometimes earlier is good too because you'll, you'll know how to build on them and maximize them. But if you find that you've been playing a lot of uh, say common critters for, ex for example and the school is available it might really be with, worth your time to pursue playing that school into your city and then maybe building a couple more common critters to maximize on it. These purple cards can give you a tremendous amount of points and you should definitely try and go after them. Finally, don't be afraid to explore the system and to explore the game. There's, there's a lot of cards that work in ways that are not clear from the very beginning. Some of these cards are uh, like the ruins and the university and the dungeon and, and the cemetery. Some of these type of cards that, that sometimes I'll see players just pass on them because they're, it seems complicated. They're not quite sure how they work. Um, when you're comfortable and familiar with the game, if you haven't already, explore these cards and see what they can do for you. Every single card has, has a purpose or multiple purposes and things that it can do. And learning how to utilize those and work with them can uh, really help you have an advantage. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope that you enjoy your time in Everdell and keep on playing and having fun. Thanks. Thanks for the tips, guys. Well, thanks for watching. Hopefully these tips are useful. Next episode in a few weeks, I'll continue with board game strategy series episode number two with some more games and more designers. If you enjoy my video, it would help us by hitting the like button and subscribe to us. You can also click the meeple in the corner and hit the bell so you'll get notified when I have the next board game strategy series up. You can also follow me on Instagram for board games, photos and reviews. So I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.